For those of you new to ITSM Academy, here's a quick overview. ITSM Academy is a full service provider of IT service management education. We develop all content in house. That includes all idle education as well as process design, agile, and DevOps. Since 2003, we've trained and certified tens of thousands of students. Now, let's introduce today's speaker, Bradley Utterback. Brad is an idle expert and has been teaching and consulting in IT service management and idle for over 12 years. He was part of the review team for the idle practitioner guidance and has written courseware for several idle courses. Brad also holds all the certifications for idle v2, idle 2011, prince2, as well as certifications for DevOps. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well. And I'm looking forward to sharing uh, with you about uh, my thoughts on status quo or status quo. Um, well, um, welcome, guys and gals. I'm excited to be here talking to you about um, the status quo or status quo. But, but let's just get some clarification on, on what this means first. Or, or what I'm talking about here, what I'm concerned. Actually, it's a, it's a concern that I have and that I have in, in all the classes that I teach, and that is to help people understand this, uh, this aspect of service management. So, woe, as you know, is, you know, you're sitting on a, on a horse and you tell a horse to woe and you think of it as doing uh, or as stopping. Um, but, um, it's also an idiom that's used for something that causes us to pay attention. You know, years ago I was um, um, I was swimming in um, swimming with a, a couple of uh, young kids that I was watching, and we were playing tag in the pool. And I jumped over uh, this uh, this young girl's head, and she looked at me, and she goes, "Whoa!" <laughs> she was amazed that I could leap so high and, and get over without being touched. So it's something like that, you know, it's for something that's new, something that's creative, something that's a game changer for, for the business, not, not necessarily um, uh, the service organization. But CSI, then uh, Continual Service Improvement, is a set of best practices that can help you move off the status quo, you know, which is doing the, the same things the same way that, that we've done um, you know, for a period of time or for years, but to move off of that and onto a status quo. And that is by ensuring that, that the service organization is in a culture, is in a culture of change or a culture that is, that is driven to continually align itself with the business. And you want to then in, ensure that your people are enabled, you know, to innovate and create new ways of being effective and efficient. You know, the, the famous last words of a dying organization is what? Is we've never done it that way before. And I know some of you are, have experienced that, probably all of you have, you know, in a situation or in a, a culture of an organization that's not willing to innovate or not willing to change. And what happens? Right? Things start, um, usually things start dying off at that point. OK, but it takes to be in a culture of, of innovation or when what I mean by that is a culture that continually is willing to align its business uh, uh, goals and objectives with the changing needs of the customers and the changing times and such. It takes people, people with different skills, different training. But perhaps the most important thing, I think, uh, is a mindset of of innovation or being willing to accept uh, the uh, the fact that the companies need to uh, to innovate or to make changes along the way, and so that means uh, that means a, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of openness, and an understanding in the value of stability, and those things together um, make up innovation. It provides opportunities for for changing and aligning yourself with the business. So, so a culture of innovation. Then, uh, and if you buy into that, or if you buy into that need, 
um, a culture of innovation engages the whole organization, not just the, the service department, not just, so the whole organization. So that means things like business assets, which include all the assets in IT. You know, we've got to get rid of this, um, and uh, this, uh, this us and them mentality. You know, so we don't have business assets and IT assets, right? They're all what? They're all business assets. And then same thing with business processes. That includes the traditional business processes and IT processes. But guess what? They're all business processes. And we're talking about, um, you know, ITIL. Many of you are probably aware that, that ITIL is undergoing some innovation right now. Why? Well, to align itself, to align its best practice, to keep it up to date and align with the, the current um, uh, 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 culture of, uh, of business and, and business needs and the new uh, identification, uh, identification of, of newer, uh, more current best practices and such. So all of these processes are considered, should be considered business processes, in my opinion anyway. All right, so, so let me give you an example. Let me share a story with you of this, um, related to this. So um, a few years ago, I was in New, downtown New York, uh, New York City, um, uh, teaching a class uh, for an organized, rather large organization. And um, after the class, um, a lady uh, who was the the customer for that for that class asked me to step into her office and talk with her and another uh, person, uh, a guy, um, about about handling incidents. So they wanted to know how to be more effective and efficient at handling incidents. So um, I walked into her office and after a few minutes uh, of chatting and answering this, it seemed to me that they were doing okay with handling incidents. So I started asking them the why questions. Okay, why did she want to improve on incident handling? And, and the reason that she said was because she had a backlog of incidents. So I asked her, why? <laughs> Why do you have a backlog of incidents? Why do you have so many incidents? Well, that is because she answered because they were supporting over 800 or 900 applications. And I thought that was a lot. So as I probed in a little bit further, it turned out that they were had many applications that were performing duplicate functions. So you know what I asked her then, right? I asked her the why question. Why do you have so many applications? Why are there so many duplicates? And then here's what she said. She says, because they were not involved in the business change process. And the business policy driven from the CEO on down was such that the individual business units had the authority to approve their own changes. To prove, and that included IT changes. So if they wanted an application, the business unit got their, their, their managers together and they discussed it and they decided, you know, we think this application would work for it. So they approved it and IT was not involved in that decision. So you can kind of imagine what happened. It resulted in a backlog of changes and a backlog of incidents. And then it resulted in, guess what? a very poor image of the IT department. But, but where was the issue? It was back in the policy for the business, for business change. So the point here, what's the point? Um, if you wanna create <clears throat> this, uh, this status quo, if you will, you'd be, the organization would start at the top level at the business at the uh, the CEO level and establish policies such that the business units and the IT units would be working together with changes in in handling their changes or the other way of looking at it is to to see that that IT and the business units are all business units the service department is a business unit of the organization. So when there's a change that comes across, 
a, a change that happened that it could affect other business units as well as the IT business unit, then um, we need to be aware of that and we need to have a, a culture of, of, of awareness for that. And so when something changes in the business needs, business goals, business objectives and such, that's going to have a ripple effect all the way down through the service organization and all the other business units. So the, the, so the biggest challenge for them at this time was how to get the business involved. So it's because you see most of the priority, uh, most of these incidents and changes were all high priorities. You can probably imagine that. They all had, a, there was a, a lack of agreed prioritization schema. So they had, uh, the IT reputation was in the tank because they couldn't keep up and the business didn't understand why. Question then, how do you get the business to update its change policies. And that was that was at the end of our, the meeting I had with them, that was the question that they had is how do we get the business, you know, to work with us? So if you want the status quo and be in a status quo mode, you can't operate like this. Now, there was this, uh, the, the Boston Consulting Group um, that did a survey in a few couple years ago and found the importance of the speed in business innovation is on the rise. Okay, so look at that. The speed of business innovation is on the rise with the executives citing overly long development times as the biggest obstacle to innovation. It also noted that the changing role of technology across industries. In other words, technology used to live in its own silo. Okay, so many of you are aware of that and are probably thinking, okay, so I get that. You know, we got to break down the silos, especially in the IT department. The report also said that today, digital and mobile big data and other technologies are used to support and enable innovation across the organization from new product development to manufacturing and to go to market strategies in multiple industries. So what the Boston Consulting Group is talking about here is the same thing that I and other consultants and trainers in this area have been saying for a while. And that is organizations cannot afford to treat the IT department as an IT department but as, a, as, an, as another business unit within the organization. So I've, I've taught uh, many classes for people um, in IT and then they shared how they wish that people from the IT side um, of the, or, um, oh, excuse me, that people from the business side of the organization were listening and learning what was being covered. Many uh, have been preaching, if you will, the value of eliminating silos and not just in IT, but in the business. So often there is a business unit and IT segmentation. There's an us and them mentality and it needs to stop. That mentality seriously hurts organizations and you end up blaming uh, business units, including IT, when actually it was the it's business policies that are causing the issues. Now, many of you know that ITIL um, is undergoing an update. This year is uh, a, a crucial year for it. There'll be a lot of, uh, of the documentation coming out, you know, about it. Uh, but one of the ITIL updates modus operandi is to do what it can to eliminate any silo mentality or silo language. Um, and that's going to be real difficult to do, but there, that's one of their, um, one of the things that that's crucial for, for this update. So the point I'm trying to make here is that organizations can't afford to have an us and them perspective on the business and IT, including the, the, between the business units. Okay, now, the uh, according to this Boston uh, Consulting Group survey, just as an example, some of the most innovative companies uh, are listed here. So we've got these 10 companies and then there's uh, 10 other companies uh, listed here, you can, um, the, so, uh, so we've got these companies. So the, the, the status quo, um, it has been here for a while. 
And so what I'm saying is that to look at some of these companies, they are innovative companies. You look at them and you go, whoa, whoa, as an example, how do they keep up with the innovation? How do they keep going like that? Now, you'll notice that some of these companies, they're, they're not, not all of them are IT companies, like maybe uh, you might expect. Okay, but you've got uh, pharmaceutical companies, automotive companies, retail companies, hotels, and other type of companies that, that are trying to stay relevant, you know, to the business. Okay, so, so how does CSI fit into this? How does CSI fit in? Okay, well, this is, this is the crux of what I would like to talk about here um, after setting the, the stage uh, between the business and IT and keeping the status quo. Uh, CSI is a framework that will help you uh, uh, to, make, to get and maintain that status quo. Um, it's a framework that I've used and uh, uh, other uh, consultants use as a basic outline for doing consulting work to help you identify opportunities and continually work at ensuring that the current and the future service management processes and technologies are aligned with the changing needs of the business. And that's a crucial thing about this, is with the changing needs of the business. Okay, the business needs to see all the processes and assets in the organization as a whole, including the service organization. I'll give you another example of this. The, this uh, company that I was at um, uh, just this, uh, this year, they have been building and maintaining loyal customers and um, employees since 1859. I was there earlier this year, and like I said, and I was impressed with this, with the young and older people in the class. So they had they had young people and they, they had older people and both of them, both groups were excited to be working at that organization. I talked to a couple of them about the, the company and they said that the company is right now or right then and, and right now too, I'm sure, was is in chaos. They're in chaos. Why? because they're having to, to, to do something to reinvent themselves a little bit right now. Question for you, is, is chaos a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, many of you are probably answering, okay, well, it depends. Yes, okay, um, so, Brad, I have Greg says both. <laughs> As uh, so, the changing names, but they were, they were embracing um, the, the chaos as an opportunity. And that's one of the things that impressed me, that the, that, that the company was in the process of reinventing themselves. And they, uh, both older and the younger generations were excited about being there. Now to me, that, that is, that speaks to this woe that I'm talking about. Because as I was working with them and, 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 and chatting with them and seeing how excited they were to be there working um, at that organization and the opportunities that they had there, they were able to use their skill sets to, to help uh, the organization, um, uh, help be a part of the organization um, uh, making some, some changes that it, that it needs to make. So the CSI approach helps you to define then uh, a, place, uh, a place to start and a place to, to take that um, um, that opportunity for innovation and and give it some wheels and give it some positive direction. Now, um, I'd like to say uh, to say something about CSI in general and the CSI approach uh, approach, and that is the CSI approach enables um, the objectives of service management. Some of you may uh, uh, remember what service management uh, objectives are, uh, but there's three of them. There are three basic ones, and they're, they're kind of fun here. Uh, the first one is to align IT with the business. And, and that means that a, a, a constant um, uh, analysis and assessment of whether or not the, uh, the service management or the service department's objectives are aligned with the current business needs and current objectives. And as you know, um, the current objectives uh, or the objectives of the business can change over time. Uh, the customer's 
uh, of the business can change over time. So we're always in, in the service organization, we're always aligning ourselves, always adapting to, these, to these, those changing environments. So we need this culture of innovation, right? So that we understand that we need to embrace that and make changes. The other things that happens is changes in technologies that enable us to be more effective, more efficient, be able to meet our customer needs um, uh, um, better. Okay, the next one here is improving the service quality or the quality of the service. That's, al again, aligned with the business needs. So it starts with understanding the business. So improving the service quality, making it more effective and more efficient. And then the other uh, objective in service management is to reduce and manage costs. Okay, so reducing and manage costs. Um, in, again, in line with the business goals and objectives. So the starting point of this is um, aligning the business with the, uh, uh, aligning uh, IT with the business goals and objectives. So this uh, AIR, I like to say service management, service management is the air we breathe. <laughs> service management is the air we breathe, right? Aligning IT with the business, reducing costs, or excuse me, um, uh, improving service quality and reducing or managing costs. And this is directly related to, support, uh, to what the CSI approach is all about. The first objective here, or, or the first thing in the um, a set of activities in service management is to, um, uh, is to determine uh, the business vision, mission, goals, and objectives. So this is directly related uh, to uh, the first step in the CSI approach. So we're trying to understand the business goals and objectives. And it's at this first stage that IT then would define its specific goals and objectives being driven by a clear understanding of what the business is trying to accomplish. So for example, um, the business and IT connect here. So if you want this status quo, well, the business and IT must identify its barriers and eliminate them when and where they can, when and where it's possible. So that means the business needs to trust the service organization as well as the service organization needing to trust the business. So the service organization also then needs to listen carefully to the business to see what, um, what its plans are. Now, um, this, there was a, um, a, uh, a company that I, I did some work for, in a, a different company, and they um, uh, it did a, uh, uh, an, an assessment over the whole company, and after that, as a result of that assessment, the result of that assessment came up with a two-year plan. And part of that two-year plan was uh, for IT to, to fix its supplier and and business relationship management processes. Okay, so do you see what's going on here with this first step? You determine the business vision, mission, goals, and objectives, and then at some point the service department picks up and gets a specific goal and objective. So in there were that, that specific goal and objectives for the service organization was to uh, fix the supplier management and the business relationship management process. Okay, so that then is the starting point for this CSI approach. Okay, and that, doing it that way ensures that whatever we're maturing or whatever we're fixing um, is aligned with the business goals and objectives. So another question for you. Do you improve or do you always improve on the least mature IT process? Do, 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 do. What do you think? Do you always mature on the least mature process? Well, if our goal and objective is to stay aligned to the continually changing needs of the business, if that's our objective in our service organization, then how can you say that we're going to mature on the least mature process? Instead, you would say something like, well, we are, need to improve or make adjustments to the process or processes that are going to be most aligned with the current business goals and objectives. So the basic answer is no. 
you improve on the one that at that moment will have the best positive impact on the business. So in a, in a, one objective in IT then is not to define and mature its processes, but to align its policies and processes with the changing needs of the business. So the output of this first step of the CSI approach then is a clearly stated objectives of the improvements and changes that we need to make that are aligned with clearly stated business objectives and clearly stated vision. So the next one here is the next step in the CSI approach is to do then an assessment. So once you get the, the, the specific focused area, then you can do an assessment on that specific area, right? So that's after it's after that's settled, a focused assessment can then be done. So, and this is gonna determine the gaps between the business and IT or, or be the gaps between what we're doing now and what we're supposed to be doing or the outcomes that we're delivering now and the outcomes that we're supposed to be delivering. This assessment is gonna determine then the current level of maturity. And, and on the case I was uh, sharing with you earlier, it would be the supplier management and the business relationship management. What is the current level of maturity of that? And then this is also gonna be um, resulting in reports on the impact and the current state of maturity that, that the current state of maturity has on the business objectives at, that are identified in the first step. Now, the next step, the next phase here is setting measurable targets. So we have a, a clear uh, business aligned, defined desired state, and this is precisely what you want to achieve by doing the improvement. So what impact on the business outcomes are supposed to happen by making the improvements? All right, so this is the first type of measure. So, um, so the point that I'm making here is that when we set our targets, we set our goals and objectives, one of them should be focused on the business outcomes, right? What are the desired business outcomes? And clearly define what those are first. Then, then we can determine this second type of measure, which would then be the service department measurements. You know, so these would be the things that would be documented in SLAs, service level agreements or operational level agreements and so on. This is where we have agreed measurable targets of the specific improvement or of the service that's enabling these business outcomes. We want to set targets then that are measurable. We want to set targets that are achievable. Because otherwise, we overstress um, our employees, if you will. So we want them to be achievable, but we also want them to add value. Value in terms of what? Value in terms of facilitated business outcomes. Question, who determines value? Who determines value or value in a service? It would be the customer, right? So when we, when we set these targets in order to bridge that gap or to achieve a certain level of maturity that was determined um, in our assessments. Uh, we wanna be sure that those improvements are having a positive impact on business outcomes. So we want them, to, the metrics to be um, measurable, achievable, and, and add value. So the next, questions then that come up is whether or not we are we are bridging this gap this gap that we've uh, determined as a result of our assessment so here's the thing um, the objectives that we determined in the first step minus the assessments that we did that this is which results in our current level of maturity then is going to equal that gap then the next question is you know, how much of that gap can we bridge? How much of that gap should we bridge? All right, so now the assessment plus the new targets that we achieve are, are equaling the, the capabilities and the resources that we need to bridge that gap. And that is your defined future state. Then we prioritize the improvements based on objectives. What objectives? 
well, the objectives of uh, that we determined back uh, earlier, objectives of the business as well as the objectives of the service organization. So we set targets in IT then to ensure that these objectives are achieved and we document those in our service level agreements and operational level agreements. So the question that we should be asking then is are our resources and capabilities uh, aligned with those objectives? The other thing, uh, the, the other point that I think is important here as we're trying to bridge this gap is to ensure that we're engaging the right people from the business and from IT. Status. When I say status quo, I mean the status quo is a culture of innovation. The status quo is a culture where people are open to and engaged in ensuring that the business as well as IT are up to date with the customer needs, whether uh, uh, the real needs and the perceived needs of the customers. Status quo is where, where a, the business, where the organization sees business assets, not not business assets and IT assets. They're all business assets. All those resources and capabilities in the business, we should see them as a whole, as a unit, so that we can achieve this, this culture of innovation and working together to ensure that our, our business processes and activities are aligned with the goals and objectives of the business. So the next step here in the, in the CSI approach is how, is, uh, is how we get there. So the, the plan, then we need to have a plan. <laughs> the, the plan is based then on the priorities that are determined by the previous step and the plan is executed as design activities and transition activities. And for those of you who are familiar with, with ITIL, understand um, that a little, uh, under, should be understanding that. So we do, once we determine where we wanna go, and where we need to be, then we can start designing the hardware, uh, coming up with a plan uh, uh, for the hardware and the software and the processes that we need, the organizational structure that we need to support, uh, to support that plan. That's what we call design activities. And then we execute on that, that's called transition activities. Other aspect of this is proper communication, executing on the plan, and then testing the plan. That's also a part of service transition. And then as a result of those tests, we may identify other uh, improvements or minor changes to the plan, you know, to ensure that the, um, to ensure that the object goals and objectives will be met that were determined earlier. The outputs of this phase, or the output of this step then, is an approved action plan, um, also efficiency and execution, and also then the completed improvements. So this is takes us through design and through transition. By the end of this, this part of the CSI approach, we have a, a plan that's been enacted. Okay, the last step here, is to um, is measurements and metrics. Um, measurements and, and metrics. We want to be sure that we got there. So this is the operational step um, that we take uh, to ensure that we're meeting the objectives. So it's not enough just to meet the targets. So, but we ask that question. You know, when the targets that we established in the third step. Um, we got to ask the question, did we meet those targets? Did we meet the SLAs? Did we meet the operational level agreements? Okay, but is that good enough? So it's, um, we got to also ask the question, did by meeting those targets, did we also meet the objectives? Did we also meet the objectives that were agreed back up in step one? The next question that we've got to ask is whether or not the, the business got value out of it. Did the business get value? So we met the targets, we met the objectives. The last question is, did was there value in it? And that can only be answered by, by the customer. So it's not just enough to meet the business objectives. We got to ask the question, did the business process improve by 30%? So to be in the status quo, well, we've got to be asking that value question. 
what did what did the improved business process support or enable that was enabled by IT do for the organization? How did it contribute to the mission, goals, and objectives of the organization? All right, a couple of quick stories. Um, there was a testing or certification organization recently underwent some very intensive restructuring due to the, the due to the need of newer certifications. Um, translated, uh, they needed to reinvent themselves. And uh, but in all honesty, they didn't accurately predict the impact that this was going to have on their business processes. So they had a new inflow of business. And uh, it resulted in significant backlogs and even duplication of work and emails sent to customers that were uh, that caused confusion and delays. Um, and part of the issue was that the IT couldn't keep up due to the business underestimating the volume of business transactions. Another story, a certain company changed the quality of its trademarked jeans. And I'll, I, <laughs> the reason why I'm sharing this because this happened to me I guess a couple of weeks, a week or so ago, and I was about to buy a couple of a couple of pair because the last ones lasted a couple of years. That was really great. But then I read the reviews and 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 how uh, the quality had changed. They they did something different to the jeans that changed the quality. So I wouldn't change them. So I wouldn't buy them. You know. So you know what's those are some negative stories there. But what's the point? Um, the, the changes to the business and resulting changes to the service organization as well uh, as other business units need to be evaluated and verified with their customers or, or what the targets are and whether or not the targets were achieved. But also feedback from the business will enable the business to make better decisions in the future. The business also needs to be open as to how it can better understand how to integrate the service organization into business planning. So even in both those stories, I know the second story we just focused on genes, but there was uh, IT is working behind the scenes to support these business decisions. You know, the, the point I'm making here is that the business, IT, and IT is the business. I mean, it's all part of the same organization. All right, so, so we've got the, the, the uh, we've done, uh, set the business goals and objectives and the vision. We've done the assessment to determine the gap. We've set measurable targets that are aligned with those business goals and objectives to achieve a certain different level of maturity or, or, or changes that will enable that. Okay, then um, uh, we've done the design work, we've done the transition, uh, the service has been operational for a while, now we evaluate it and see how well it's uh, uh, aligning with the business. And, and then we look for other opportunities to change. So the question then is, how do you keep this going? How do you keep this status quo well going? How do you keep on top of the changing needs? How do you keep prioritize proper prioritization based on business impact and business cases? You need to identify the stakeholders and have the stakeholders change. Are there different stakeholders for different opportunities? Identifying communicate, identifying risks and communication risks uh, um, back to the business where it's necessary. Governance and compliance. Uh, taking lessons learned uh, to the business and business unit as well as the service organization. In, in, in some organizations that, that I've been to, this last point here, that, that, or this point that's up here is difficult, you know, to get the business to, to, to listen. And so this is why it's important, you know, to, to have this culture of innovation being driven from the top down. That's the, the best way for it to work. Another a comment that, that a friend of mine likes to make, he says, readers are leaders. And um, there's a, um, I'm not sure if I should, Mention a, oh, I can mention it. I think a really great book out there called The Innovation Code. That's an awesome short book to read if any of you are, are uh, wanting to read up on chaos and innovation and and things like that, dealing with it. Um, that's kind of a cool book, you know, to read. Okay, so so Karen, I think you've got a couple of, of polling questions here. Could you push put the first one up here? I'd like to to ask that one at this time. It's our first polling question, and this is what comes to mind when you hear the word chaos, confusion, disruption, innovation, 
unpredictable or opportunity? Well, right now, unpredictable is in the lead with 42 percent, followed by confusion with 27. I mean, I'm sorry, right, opportunity. Maybe. Opportunity at 42 percent. Oh, opportunity. OK, yeah. great. Yeah. 65 yep. percent have voted. So I'm going to close this one now. All right. Thank you. So um, if you're in the in the status, whoa, you would see chaos as opportunities. Because chaos is telling you that chaos is telling you that something needs to change. Right. Chaos is telling you that something needs to change. So our next polling question is what causes chaos in the service organization? Changes in business needs, change management, terminology, knowledge management, other. And oh, our big winner looks like it's going to be changes in business needs. And yeah. followed, yes, and followed by other. And some of the other that I'm having is lack of communication, silos, lack of communication, and other lack of vision and governance. Yeah, all those. There's a lot of the answers, you know, viable, uh, you know, answers to that question. And the reason I'm asking is I just wanted to get you to, to think about that a little bit. Well, Brad, interestingly enough, terminology is zero and knowledge management is zero. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so I wanted you to, to think about these uh, these these questions a little bit, and and relate it to the, a a um, a status to to the status quo concept that I'm trying to promote here, um, where you see uh, chaos is opportunity, and then you you see that the changing business needs cause chaos, which is uh, but that's a good kind of chaos. Um, commu faulty communication then, um, another uh, cause of chaos there. Um, you see that as uh, as an opportunity and rather than, you know, freaking, freaking out about it, you start figuring out ways of what you can do, you know, to work with that. Um, but it's hard, you know, to, uh, in some organizations, I know it's hard because, you know, you're working with people all the time. And it's almost like even in a uh, in an organization where you get paid, you know, and and you know for to do your job and stuff, it still feels like in a lot of respects like you're working in a volunteer organization. Right? Where you you have to be be careful with with how you work with people and, and such and you've got to get you've got to do what you can to get buy in. You just can't say I want you to buy into this cuz I'm your boss. You really can't do that anymore. Third poll is what is the value of chaos? There is no value in chaos. It's a motivator. It helps people to focus. Chaos should be avoided when possible or other. And 70% is it's a motivator. Seven, oh, yes. Right. 17% is it helps keep people focused. 9% is chaos should be avoided when possible. And 4% is other. And I just have one. Um, only one chat about that and it's chaos happens from time to time you just minimize it and go on right yeah so yeah so chaos um a couple of you commented or, or chose you know chaos should be avoided um, at all costs or chaos should be avoided see there's you can't avoid chaos chaos is going to happen right it's just going to happen so something changes in the business needs that means there, there's something that that needs to change in our uh, that, that we need to change to align with us. And it causes at that point some confusion. We got to talk, communicate, you know, and, and this is what I'm saying, you know, to be able to do that, you need to have this culture of innovation. You have a culture or a mindset of, of embracing, of embracing change. All right. So take a look at some of these things. Many of us get stressed out over chaos, right? Is that a good thing or a bad? Well, that's okay. We get stressed out over a lot of things in life that are good. Right. It's just get getting over it and figuring out how to uh, um, how to work, uh, how to how to work through it. So chaos is a good thing in a culture that embraces innovation that understands the value of that. And that type of culture understands the, the need to change, the need to change in order to stay relevant. OK, so what? OK, so cut questions for you. And this is what I would like to close with. What do you see when you look up on a clear night? See the stars, right? Everyone sees the stars, and depending on the the, the, 
the month, the, the time of the month, you'd see the moon. But you know what? That's what everybody sees. That's what everybody sees. But if you want to see the status quo, you need to look deeply. You need to look beyond the stars. You need to look between the stars. Now, um, a few years ago, the Hubble telescope um, uh, had an unobstructed view of the universe. In April 1990, it was launched uh, so long, it weighed so much, weighed the diameter, there's some facts about it. But here's the thing, in order to take, oh, no, no, no. So, so in order to take images, uh, it had to remain, you know, perfectly still and all that kind of good stuff. But here's what they did with the Hubble telescope. They pointed it beyond the stars of our Milky Way. And that basically is 127 millionth of the sky. It's like if, you, so if you look up at the sky and you see just one, are able to focus on 127 millionth of the sky and look, that, that would enable you to look outside of our Milky Way, outside of our galaxy. And you know what they found? I asked that question the other day to somebody and he goes, wow, they found nothing. <laughs> Here's what they found. They found over 10,000 galaxies in one picture. One twenty-seven millionth of the sky, they found one picture. Everybody looks up at the sky and they see the stars, but they don't see these things. They found over 5,000 galaxies in two other pictures, just like this. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's amazing. Okay, so anyone can look up and see the stars. Question. Don't you want to also, don't you want to see the galaxies? Don't you want to look into the chaos? Look at the chaos. Everyone sees the chaos. Everyone sees, everyone feels, you know, most everyone, you know, feels, sees, senses that chaos and the, and, and the existing structure. But don't you want to look beyond that and see opportunity? in order to creatively align the changing business needs and the service management processes and your technology. You know, the CSI approach, you know, well, that takes that mindset to be able to apply the CSI approach in a way that ensures that we are aligned with the business. So where would you like to be? You know, in the status quo or the status quo? The CSI best practices help you to obtain and maintain uh, an innovative culture. A couple of last questions here and I'll close with this. What is your starting point for CSI? Gonna depend on your whether or not you're an innovative culture or how innovative your culture is. Start with the business goals, objectives. Maybe you are the only one who gets this and you're in an organization where you feel stifled. Well, don't let that stop you. Right, to start documenting, you know, where your struggles are or the, the issues that you're having and then pass it up to your manager when they look to you and say, look, we need to, how come you're, you're having a hard time with this? You go, well, look, here's what's happening. Here's why this is a struggle. This book, The Innovation Code, I shared earlier is a good book to read. And uh, there's my email address in case you have any questions. Um, and so, so Karen, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and, and thank you all for, uh, for listening in and I hope it's been helpful. I look forward to answering some of your questions uh, when we're done.